So in last week's video, we changed the grease in the dual milling machine head here, this section of it anyway, the section that has the gears in it for the power down feed. Well, it's time to change the grease in the section that houses the high and low speed gears for the spindle. There's still a lot to do to this machine before it's all cleaned up and back together, but I'll feel a lot better once the grease has changed in this because it is four years old and there's quite a bit of it in there. So let's get our gloves on and uh, dig in. It's, it's gonna be greasy. So in order to get the grease out of the head of this thing, what I'm gonna do is rotate this head 90 degrees. It has some bolts here, just like any other milling machine almost, except for this doesn't have a, a nod function. This head only rotates, but that's still all we need to get this thing turned around to where we can kinda spatula that stuff out. I'm struggling a bit to get this head to turn. I've got all four of those bolts through the back loose. I've got this bolt here loose. I'm not for sure what's going on. I think you turn this and it turns a gear in there, but I'm not 100% for sure. But I think I'm right. So I've been struggling for the last 10, 15 minutes trying to get this head to rotate. There's four locking screws in the back and then you turn this shaft that works a worm gear and it rotates the head or at least that's what I thought. <laughs> for the one person out there who owns one of these you probably already know what was keeping me from moving this but for the other 40,000 of you I want to show you a really neat locking feature and locating feature that this that this head has. It's pretty cool. Man, it had me stumped. Let me show you what I found. It's, I like it. It's neat. So other than the bolts around the perimeter here, there's the one bolt here. I thought it was just another clinch bolt to squeeze these two together, but it's not. It's very special. And how many bolts do you think, in order to take it out, you have to tighten it up? Well, this is not just an ordinary bolt. This tighten it up and then it comes out. It's a tapered pin that locks this head in trim. No wonder it couldn't turn the thing. So that's odd. You know, I only figured it out after I thought I'd tighten everything back up and then loosen it up and try it again. But by tightening this, it popped loose. So that's it. It was a tapered pin holding it all together. So reading the instructions would have probably helped, but you know, most of this stuff's pretty obvious, but sometimes you run into things like that that, that really stump you. This stuff looks like it's in a lot better shape than the stuff in the power down feed box. Most of this stuff has never moved since the day that was put in. So I think that's it. It's quite a bit of grease in that head. They definitely weren't stingy with it. Let's go see what it weighs and see if we got enough to replace it. So let's see what it weighs. That's quite a bit. So that's three pounds, five ounces is what it looks like. So what is that? 52, 53 ounces. That's quite a bit. So at 14 ounces a tube, so 14, 28, 
42 and 56. So that's four tubes of grease in the head of that melon machine. That'd be close enough. So these two bearings here are what was not getting oiled because they were had been packed full of grease and these are the caps that we took off a couple videos ago. So I'm just putting those back on because they're cleaned out now. But those run on the counter shafts that operate the high and low speed of this gearbox. So pretty critical that those you know, get oil like they should. You're such a helicopter mom. <laughs> now let's So in the upper section of the head here, I didn't wash it out like I did the uh, power down feed gearbox in the previous video, simply because there wasn't any real debris in this part of the box. No major gear wear, nothing like that, no metal particles. So all I did was scrape out the bulk of the grease, 90% of it, and then replace it with some new, some fresh grease. that's full and then it'll spread itself out and settle where it needs to go. Hmm. That's odd. <laughs> so check that out. Underneath the do-all badge is the do-all badge. So that's about as clean as I'm going to try to get this thing. Not worried if it's perfect or not. But it looks good. This is the cover, obviously, for the top of the milling machine, and it and it uh, seals up the high and low speed gearbox uh, grease area. That way, no smoo gets in there. So when I removed the drive pulley from the spindle of the milling machine, I had to heat it in order to get it off because it's a shrink fit. Obviously, they want this thing fitting on the top of that spindle pretty tight, so it doesn't vibrate or cause any issues. So in order to get it back on, we're going to have to do the same thing. So let's heat this up and see if we can't drop it on there and not have any issues. So I'm going to be heating this up a little bit. 
up to 212 degrees or around 100 degrees C. I'm going to use a heat indicating pen. That way I don't overheat this. No reason to go any hotter than that. And it should slide right on that spindle. Almost there. This thing will lose heat pretty quick. There we go. Slid right on there. So if you haven't seen these before, they're pretty neat. I know most of us probably have, but what it is is a heat sensitive marker that melts at a specific temperature and you can get these in, a, in the whole range of temps. Now I've got a bunch of them myself and I use them to get in the ballpark. I'm not trying to get exact. Like this one's 101C because 101C was cheaper when I bought this than 100C, right? So. You get the idea. These just get you close, but they are neat and uh, they are accurate. But you know, when you're heating something with a flame, it's hard to get a good smooth temperature on the whole surface. Good for welding prep or preheat. So there you go. Pick you up some of those. You can get them about anywhere, and they're not all that expensive and very useful. They'll keep you from overheating stuff. We're up to temp out here, but just right there, still too cold. So they're neat. They work well. So this is the large nut that holds the uh, belt pulley on the top of the dual milling machine. It's also an oil reservoir. It has three wicks in it. You can see those three holes, hopefully. Those wicks are jammed in those holes so hard that uh, I can't get them back in. And I can't imagine that they oil very well being compressed that hard in those holes. So what I'm going to do is open these up just a little. 
in order to hopefully make this thing oil a little more than what it would originally. That's the idea anyway. So we're gonna try to open those up a bit. First, I gotta measure them, see what I'm working with. The machinist version of a Tiffany box, <laughs> the iconic red Starrett box that a lot of us like. These are gauge pins. They were sent to me by my buddy Ron White who had sent me the Gershner toolbox not too long ago. He asked me what tool did I want in the shop that I didn't have. And I said I'd, I'd love a start to a collection of gauge, gauge pins. So this is what he sent me. So thank you Ron. I appreciate that. These are not as expensive as a lot of you guys think probably. So check them out if you're interested. I'll open it up. I'll show you what they are. We'll gauge the sizes of these holes and we'll see if we have a reamer to open these up a bit. So gauge pins are something you'll never have all of them because you can get them in an infinite range of sizes. Now this is from 60 or from 11 thousandths of an inch up to 60 thousandths. This is from 61 thousandths up to a quarter of an inch in one thousandth of an inch increments. So each pin is a thousandth of an inch larger than the previous pin. So you know you just get a range of pins that accommodate your common work, right? I would like to have from this set up to one inch in a thousandth of an inch increments, and that's a good range for me, a good common range. So this is a great start uh, to, a, to a collection of pins. So we'll use these to stick in these holes to see if they fit or if they don't fit, and uh, you know, go from there. That'll tell us the size of the hole and it comes with a really nice stare at go no-go gauge. Both, both of these come with a holder. So let's quickly gauge these holes. Let's start off at 110. Oh, that's way loose. So let's go up 113. Still loose. 114. Still loose. 115. And that's really close. 115. That one's kind of loose. 116. No. No. Yes, so that one hole is a little larger than the others. 117. Yeah, so 117, 115. So a couple thousands bigger. Not a big deal. Just drilled holes. What I want to do is open these up. Uh, start off small. I can always open these up more later down the road. But I'm going to open them up 10 thousandths of an inch. So we need a reamer that's 126, 127 thousandths. We'll see if we got one. So there's our stare at cert on these pins. Now these are plus nothing minus two tenths. So we know they're no bigger than their stated uh, measurement, but they could be up to two tenths smaller. So they're close. They're probably three times closer than what this card says. They're probably exactly uh, what they say on them, but you get the idea. This is what they guarantee. So we got all three of our holes reamed out to supposedly 126, and that's just a random number that I chose. They don't have to be that size, but I just wanted to shoot for a number and then try to see if I could actually hit it. So, and that's the good thing about gauge pins is now that I have them, at least in these sizes, I don't have to guess on holes. I can make it and then check it, at least within a thousandth with this set. So that's right on the money. I mean. 
I don't think it gets any closer than that, or it just wouldn't fit at all. So yeah, that's uh, right there, almost too tight, but good enough. So that's what's nice about gauge pins, just being able to check your work. So now these go through those holes. You know, you got to squeeze them through there, but at least they're not smashed. Uh, completely solid in there. And the background noise that you're hearing is the shop dehumidifier. It's 70% humidity level in here at the moment, so I'm trying to bring that down. That thing works awesome. It's made life a lot easier in the shop. I leave it running. We've got a hose connected to it, and it drains out over into the stream. It pulls an amazing amount of water out of the air. Before I put the hose attachment on that so it would drain automatically, I was emptying the vessel on that thing, or the compartment where it holds water, up to three times on a really humid day, and it probably holds a gallon and a half. So <laughs> it's kept the environment in here much more tool friendly. So there's our motor with new bearings in it. So we can get a better way to get this up there. Stand here in front of your full block. Oh, I'm just stand right here. I'm just okay. right here. All right. So we got a shop visitor all the way up from California, Razor Ray. And uh, tell us about your travels. Well, what are you out this way for? I took off from Northern California, an hour north of San Francisco, and due east. So I came out 80 and then dropped Quite down to, you know, dropped down to, I don't know, I forget what. Highway took me south. I think it was 24. Some there out of Missouri. I think it was out of Missouri. I don't travel those roads. <clears throat> so I'm glad to be lost out there. My first time across country, and it's been epic. Uh, even today was was a good day. It rained, got rained on pretty heavily in a couple of spots. As a matter yeah, of fact, couldn't even see 10 feet in front of you. So 
I met Ray at the, what was it, 2019? Or no, yeah, yeah 18, I think. 18, 18 Summer, Summer Bash. Bash for the first time. So. Yeah. So, yeah, so I figured, you know, I decided to uh, um, get in touch with my buddies and my travels. It's the first time across the country for me. And uh, I am right. on my way to North Carolina to pick up a surprise. And uh, he knows what it is, but we're going to keep this mum's the word until the time comes. Yeah, Ray's got a channel. For uh, the, tell him your channel. Yeah, my so channel is Razor out. Works. Uh, nothing fancy, just me at home doing my thing. And um, I need to start shooting more videos. I haven't shot a video in probably two years or such, but... Well. Yeah, you know, but now I've got some projects on hand and everything's lined up. I'm getting my shop squared away like you. Yeah. And uh, so things are going to be happening for me as well. And so it's time to get things fired up again and share my knowledge with, with you guys out there. And yeah, so go check him out, Razorworks. Razorworks, yeah. So. Well, it's been a pleasure. Absolute pleasure Glad for me, down for sure. Glad to come down a visit. Yeah, thanks for having you me. To play so. with the, you got to play with the... Walnut, no. Chestnut. I get him so mixed up. All these nuts and squirrels. Oh, man. He uh, he's cute nonetheless. Yeah. He's absolutely adorable. So, uh, yeah, a lot of fun. Yeah, that was fun. So, so. It's a pleasure. Anyway, thanks, thanks for having again. me out. Appreciate it, Steve. Yeah. All right, you guys. Take care. That's gonna work. So I decided to move my parts washer away from the wall here in the workbench and in its place I put my machinist toolbox. Just more appropriate for it to be beside the workbench. And another thing is that I was splashing that, ever so often I'm splashing that uh, solvent out of that uh, parts washer onto the wall and I'm thinking, man, if I don't do something in the next year, this part of the wall is going to be completely black with all the greasy parts I've been doing. So. You know, I was like, well, maybe I can put some plastic up, and then I was like, well, I'll just move it all together. So in the moving of stuff, I was like, I'll just move the surface plate and that toolbox and put my big red box here, and it'll have a home. And uh, then I was like, well, it'll block my window. And that got me thinking about these windows, and back when I was considering putting them in, when I was designing this in my head, and I remember reading all the comments, and there was quite a few who said, you know, it's a horrible idea to put all that glass in a, in a machine shop for valid reasons. It's easy broke, you got to keep it clean, people can break in easier through a window, on and on and on. But still in my mind, I'm seeing this view and all the light coming in, I'm thinking to myself, it's going to be worth it, or at least that I, I hope that it is. And uh, now that it's done, 
man, I wouldn't change what I did for, for nothing. It, it, it's an amazing feeling in here versus uh, what it used to be like with just a drab, dark block wall. You know, I, could, I still remember, you know, it was like walking into a dark dungeon and now it's, you know, now it's beautiful in my opinion. So that was a good decision. I'm glad I moved forward with it and, and done it. It was a lot of extra work, but it was worth it. So the part that I have on the workbench here is the secondary or the auxiliary handle to move the table right and left on the Dual Milling Machine. A really nice feature to have. But if you watch the videos when I tore that machine down, you may remember me saying that the handle on this thing was bent. And it wasn't the handle. This shaft that goes through this piece here is actually bent. So first thing I'm going to do is clean this up. we got to find the bend, decide whether we're going to just replace this shaft, make it from scratch or try to straighten it. Something has to happen because I don't like riding bicycles with bent pedals and that's what a bent handle on a milling machine is like. So let's see what we can do. Let's clean it up first. Check it there. There we go. Now it's out. Just wasn't, wasn't trying hard enough. Checking my setup. Oh, squirrels love a little face rub. <laughs> Get him. So I had to move this thing away from the window. I used the uh, pallet jack or the, the fork truck. I put casters on this, but they were just too small, too soft for the weight of this thing. Makes, I mean, you can move it. There, it didn't deform them. It's just really hard to move with those casters, which is a pain. So I got to upgrade those. But also don't like it being so close to the window when I'm pressing on stuff. I'm not interested in breaking them. So let me show you the setup here. A couple V-blocks with a shaft on it. You can see, pretty, pretty badly bent. So that's about the highest spot. I've got a, a dial indicator here with the extension so I can gauge where I go, how much I go. All right. Just a reference. Get a little piece of brass with some V's in it. And so 
obviously we're going to have to go past straight in order to uh, to get this to stay straight, and this is just going to be trial and error. See if that straightened it up. Any? Oh wow, yeah, it worked really well. Got a little bend left in it. So there we go, it's about 15, maybe 18 thousandths. I'm gonna leave that alone. Probably won't be able to feel that in the hand wheel. But this is not exact, right? It's kind of, everything's kind of moving. But it does kind of give me an indication of how much I'm moving it. And then I went back and forth several times, just either more or less, right? Getting, using this to make sure I've got the most bent, the, the bend in the upward direction. So there you go, I think that's, Probably as good as it's going to get. I'm going to check it a little better on a plate and see exactly what it looks like. But you get the idea. It worked pretty well. So let me show you where we're at over here on the plate. We're using our big brown and sharp indicator stand. Just a tech lock dial indicator. And we're probably a quarter inch in on that shaft. So about 15, that's not bad. We could probably get it straighter if we spent you know, more time, but the chances of going back and forth, either too much or too little, you know, is pretty high, and I'll consider that a win. It definitely took a lot less time than trying to make something like this. So you probably won't feel that a little bit of bend in the handle. So there we go, good enough. So I'm assuming somebody just hit this with a forklift. It's pretty common, especially being most likely sitting in a, on the factory floor, moving parts back and forth. But yeah, so you push it in, it engages in the shaft. And it's not perfectly straight, but we knew it wasn't, but it's straight enough. So now this piece works like it should. It was a basket case before. Bent handles, zip ties, completely stuffed with grease, and you couldn't get the handle to push in and engage. But now it works like it should, and I do like my stuff, at least the majority of it, to work the way that it was intended to, to work. It's just a pleasure to use when stuff actually functions as it was intended. I think probably a lot of us have been there. If you live in an in an area like me, you probably have the old farm tractor where the only thing that works on it at all is that it runs. And it only runs on three of the four cylinders. <laughs> the brakes don't work, the lights don't work. You know, the hydraulics barely work or don't work. You know, it's low on oil. It overheats if you run it too long. All the foam's gone on the seat. I mean, it is the definition of a POS and there are no fun at all to, to use, but something that works like it should, and it's a pleasure to use a nice piece of equipment. And this is my hobby stuff, so I want to enjoy my time with it. It is a struggle to get an old machine up and going, but once, once you're done, if you just do the basic maintenance, man, that this stuff will last a guy like me forever, and I'll enjoy it for years. I'll suffer through the repair for a few months, 
but I'll enjoy the equipment for the rest of my life, chances are, so it's worth it. So I did make a little progress with my limited time this week. <laughs> Besides what I showed on the video, cleaned up around the do-all mill. All the parts that I had taken off of this were originally stacked on the floor beside the mill, and I was tripping and falling over them. So brought in this old shelf, used it also for my high-speed steel, tool steel, whatever, no, tool steel, low carbon steel, and all the do-all parts. So now the floor is clean, strapping or hold downs as well. This old shelf is in lines. Pretty nice old shelf, actually. Uh, adjustable cubbies. Al had brought this a few months ago, and it had been sitting outside under one of my mini tarps for quite a while. Damaged. It was pretty badly damaged. Somebody had tried to lift it with a forklift and bend it all the pieces at the bottom, but I straightened it out. And I think it's going to work pretty good, at least for now, right? So I think that's it. Next week, I've got some vacation time coming up from my real job that I'm really looking forward to. I need it. Um, believe it or not, I don't do this full time. It's just in the afternoons. So also got a couple, uh, couple of VIPs coming to the shop, people that you will probably know. And uh, it's going to be fun. I can't wait till they get here. I can't wait to share it with you. So I can kick back and relax, shoot some video together, and uh, just have a good time. You'll see. It's going to be fun. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Thanks to my viewers, patrons, subscribers, anybody who's supported me on this project at all, who helps me out in any way. It is very much appreciated, uh, more than you know. So that's it. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you next time. The birds fly south as the light leaves your eyes Hold on to your dream Oh, I know you wanna scream Since the day you're born You're just a flower on your own Waiting for the sun to blossom Hoping to break through the storm